Good. So let's start this uh, uh, afternoon session, BPM Forum Session 2. Uh, we have fantastic five papers uh, on, the, on the field, on the area of process mining. And uh, we have, uh, remember, we have 10 minutes per paper, then we have four minutes question and answer. And remember that if you have any, any questions you want to make, first type it. Uh, bottom, you have a Q&A chat where you can either write your questions or write that you want to make a question. And then our chat share will, uh, will order and will ask you to, to simply make the question for you, or maybe he will make the, the question. So without any further delay, let's start the first paper. Uh, a paper with title Privacy Preserving Data Publishing in Process Mining. This is a paper, a joint work between uh, Magic, Rafael, and Will Randerals. Uh, Magic, the floor is for you. Thank you. Let me share, the, share my screen with you. You can see my screen, right? Okay, let's start. Hi, everybody. Uh, and and uh, welcome to the presentation of our paper, uh, which is mainly about privacy metadata for process mining and corresponding challenges. Let's start with the motivation section of the paper. Okay, here you see two event logs and let's compare these two event logs. At the first glance, they both look like original event logs, right? But if you take a closer look, you will realize that actually table two is derived from table one by applying some anonymization operations. For example, you would see that activity F has been substituted with activities G and K, uh, or timestamps got generalized to the minutes level and resource B1 got suppressed. And that's why a process analyst should be noticed that a process model discovered from table two contains some fake activities. A performance analysis based on table two may not be as accurate as the original event log because some timestamps, uh, the timestamps got generalized to the minutes level and social network of resources is incomplete because one resource got suppressed, right? Therefore, the modifications applied by privacy or confidentiality techniques should be reflected in the event log in the form of privacy metadata or confidentiality metadata. This is the importance of the topic. But there are quite some challenges and here you see the challenges in the form of research questions and we are going to answer these questions during this presentation. The first question is that whether there is any classification for the types of modifications that could be applied or not. Second question is that whether there is any standard format for the event data so that the metadata can be formalized based on that or not. The third question, which is really important and highlights the possible risks for data leakage if we apply privacy metadata to our event logs, is that at what level of detail the privacy metadata should be added and the last question is that at what level of the data structure the metadata should be added. Okay, let's move on to the answers. For the first question about types of modifications, hopefully we can classify types of modifications or anonymization operations. And in this paper, we classify them into seven main anonymization operations as you can see here in this picture. But I'm not, for the sake of time, I'm not going to explain them in detail, although they are clear based on their names. And uh, if you want to see the exact definitions and some examples, you can refer to the paper. About the second question, which was about the format of event data, hopefully in process mining, in theory, we have event likes, uh, which are, defined as a standard inputs for the process mining activities. And in practice, we have IEEE XES standard, uh, which is a tag-based uh, grammar language for storing your data. But about the third question, which is really important question and highlights the risks for data leakage. Here you see a list of information that could be included 
in the privacy metadata. Uh, for example, we can include operation type, level of the data structure at which an operation is applied. For example, it is, is it case or event, target of the operation, which could be case, uh, event or their attributes, operation parameters, the statistics, desired analysis, and many other things that could be included. But we should see the goal of applying privacy metadata. And the goal is to give some hints to process analysts that uh, so that they avoid doing incorrect or incomplete analysis. And we should be careful that the more information that we risk, we, we share, the high risk we accept. For example, if the statistics are included, where it is indicated that only 10 out of 1,000 events have been modified, then an adversary can make sure that the transferred event log is almost the same as the original event log, right? Because there is 99% similarity, and this is risky. And that's why in this paper, we introduced the concept of anonymizer signature, which is considered as the minimal information uh, that should be included in privacy metadata. And it's composed of three uh, main parts, operation type, level of operation, and target of operation. Actually, operation type is, the, is one of the seven types that you already saw. Level of operation could be case or event, and target of operation could be case itself, event itself, or their attributes. For example, if we say that suppression event resource, that shows that suppression operation has been applied to the resource attributes of resources. But there are two important points about the anonymizer signature. First point is that anonymizer signature is designated to reflect the type and the direct purpose of the corresponding operation. The type is clear, but why do we say uh, direct purpose? We say direct purpose because of the interdependency between case and events through some attributes like traces, meaning that uh, modifying cases may affect events and vice versa. Another important point is that an anonymizer signature is not supposed to uniquely distinguish the anonymization operations applied to an event like, meaning that the same operation type could be applied at the same level and to the same target multiple times, and this is not unique. And these are two very important points about uh, an anonymizer signature. Uh, the next question was about the level of metadata in the data structure. In Event logs, we have three levels of data, log level, case level, and event, and event level. And although the anonymization operations are applied at the level of cases and events, but this is very risky to apply this metadata information at the same level. Why? Because it may lead to the predicted data leakage. For example, if you see this example here, which is actually our first motivation example, if we add privacy metadata at the level of events, then we uh, kind of disclose that, okay, we are adding this information and we show that what are the substitution uh, activities, which is G and K. So the set of substitutions could be partially or entirely disclosed that it should not happen. So that's why we suggest adding privacy metadata at the level of logs and not at the level of events or cases. And here you see in the conceptual model that we have that privacy metadata uh, is added at the level of log and privacy attributes uh, are defined based on privacy extension and privacy, the main privacy attribute is anonymizations, which is just the main attribute, which contains a list of anonymizers. It's a list to show the order of the anonymization operations that you apply. So each, then each anonymizer contains two parts, one obligatory part, which is actually our anonymizer signature, and one optional part, which, is, which includes some extra information that you can add. 
Here you see one example, which is actually the example, the XES extension example for the first motivation example that you saw. You see that the main operation, the, the main uh, attribute is anonymizations. And below that, we have a list, anonymizations is a list, which contains uh, three anonymizers, and each anonymizer shows the operation type, level, and the target. For example, for first anonymizer shows that, that at first, the anonymization operation which has been applied is substitutions uh, to the activities at the level of event, and then you see the second one, which is generalization, and then suppression. But so far, we discussed about the event data which are in the form of standard event likes, but some privacy preservation techniques may result in uh, the event data which are not in the form of standard event likes. And for handling privacy metadata for such data, we introduce in this paper the concept of event log abstraction, which is actually an XML type-based language, including two parts, header and data part. Header part is designed to store privacy metadata and data part is the data derived from the original event log. For example, here you see one example as a result of applying our uh, a connector method, which is a privacy preservation technique to the BPI challenge 2012. Then we have origin, which is BPI challenge 2012. Then the technique or method is connector method. And then we have to show that the desired analysis, which are directly follows graph and process discovery because we only have activity and previous activity. And we have to show the desired analysis here. Here you see a screenshot of our tool, which is a complement for this presentation, which supports the practical aspect of our uh, research for this paper and also the other privacy preservation techniques that we have developed. And I kindly, uh, I um, invite you to attend our uh, tool demo session tomorrow at 1.45. These are the links for the practical aspect uh, of what you already saw. And uh, that's it. Thank you. If you have any question. Thank you very much, Mahit. Uh, very nice presentation. Now it's time for questions. Uh, Masi, do we have any questions from the audience? Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Massimo De Leone from Padova. Uh, at this, please uh, feel free to ask questions at this moment. Uh, uh, you are too shy. Just put out your comments. We are looking forward to hearing them. Maybe I can start with one question to Majid. Um, yeah. Majid, I, I was wondering, so looks like uh, you have focus on the architectural and the, you know, the data uh, model uh, underlying this anonymization. But I was wondering if you see challenges on the algorithmic side uh, which also might be interesting to pursue in this, in this regard. Yes, but in this specific paper, we are not focused on the algorithmic side of these challenges. And we have in the process mining, uh, if we see the overview of privacy, we have privacy preserving data publishing and privacy preserving process mining. And the algorithms are for pro privacy preserving process mining and also the techniques for privacy preservations are privacy preserving data publishing, but here we are only focused on the underlying anonymization operations for privacy techniques, not the algorithms, not the specific algorithms. That's good, thanks. Maybe I can also myself ask a question if you don't mind. Good. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. I think it's a very important topic. When we work with companies, we always are confronted with this problem that they don't want to share certain sensitive information. So I'm wondering whether you have started investigating what you could do with anonymized data. So now you, sh you provide a way to anonymize, let's say a standard to show anonymized data, uh, event log. Uh, have you tried to apply existing techniques and see how anonymity would affect the results that you obtain? Yeah, for sure. We have in any privacy preservation techniques that we apply, one aspect that we consider is the effect, is the effects on applying this technique on data utility side. But here, 
what we want to add is that, okay, we can improve data utility aspect by adding privacy metadata. Because if you are not aware what is going on in the anonymized event log, so you may do some incorrect or incomplete analysis. And here our focus is actually to kind of improve data utility of the anonymized event log by adding privacy metadata. Oh, okay, thank you. Actually now Agnes has a question. So I will make her able to ask the question herself. Uh, so please Agnes, uh, go ahead. Yes, now I'm, I'm, I'm muted. Hi, Majid, thanks for your talk. Hi, Agnes. Hi, um, so your approach is up, you apply your privacy metadata on log data. And, and I was asking myself if your approach uh, can only be applied if you have one central event log, or can you also use, and I assume not, if you have distributed or splitted event logs, which no, can be the case. Uh, because splitting event logs also prevent from uh, disclosure. Yeah, this is actually a very good question. But here, as you already answered your question, yeah, we are just focused on the single event logs, not distributed event logs. I mean, if, if you distribute event logs into different parts, then we should uh, kind of uh, come up with another idea so that we can distribute our privacy metadata in the event logs. Uh, so that they can show for each independent event log. And then if we put all of them together, the privacy metadata is still valid or it can support that. I think it would be really very interesting to yeah. see if you split the event log, how much, let's say, uh, information you can disclosure and, and, and maybe apply your approach on a deeper level or something like that. Yeah, sure. Either work. Yeah. So, so for the sake of time, I would suggest to finish here. And of course, remember that there is this uh, author's coffee where you can uh, uh, actually attend and, and interact with the author. So thanks again, Majid, for your nice work and your nice presentation. You're welcome. Let's, let's move on. Next Thank speaker you. is Rihan Sayed. Uh, maybe now, uh, can you stop sharing, uh, Mahi? Yeah, I already stopped. Okay. Now, Rihan, you can uh, put your presentation. Uh, so the paper from Rihan, uh, it's uh, Process Mining Adoption, a Technology Continuity versus Discontinuity Perspective. This is a joint work with uh, Rihan, which is the presenter, Rihan Sayer, then Sander Lehman, uh, Rebecca Eden, and Joe Speaks. Uh, so, Rihan, the floor is yours. Whenever you want, you can start. Just one second. I'm struggling with the presentation. Hang on. So you can see my screen? One second. Yes, you can go ahead. So it's 10 minutes. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, everyone listening to this presentation. Uh, myself, Syed, and my colleagues and co-authors, Sandra, Rebecca, and Yus, warmly welcome you to this presentation. This is uh, still a work in progress uh, in process mining adoption. Uh, we have taken the perspective from uh, Will's uh, Professor Will's recent interview to Gartner's, where he talks about what are the barriers, barriers for process mining. And first barrier mentioned was the people. So we look at the people issue in this presentation. So it's not a technical presentation. So let me walk you through the, the topic and the agenda for discussion. So we all know that process mining is a key contributor that involves data-driven analysis. You guys are expert in this area. I'm not going to bore you with this discussion. Mining includes and provides organization capabilities to monitor performance indicators, explore process models, and actually as an alternative to various other process analysis techniques used by organizations like Lean Six Sigma, et cetera, et cetera. 
However, to date, there is a limited research into how process mining has been used within organization and how organization adopt or not uh, this new uh, technology for, for their business decision making. So we examine the, uh, there is an ongoing uh, adoption of process mining within an organization currently using uh, process mining. Uh, and we, had, we look at the lens of theory of technology discontinuity by Tushman and Anderson. Our research question was, what are the factors that influence process mining continuity in organizations? So from the theoretical background, uh, general perception in management is that as soon as you implement a technology, it means that benefits will be immediately realized and outcomes will be available right from the beginning. However, this technology acceptance is an important precursor for users to first use and then adopt uh, in order to achieve the benefit realization of any technology. So our focus was in this paper to understand and explore the tensions between legacy and new practices and discontinuity of the use of existing practices because of process mining technologies and organizations. We adopted Tushman's and Anderson's uh, theory of discontinuity as a lens to explain our data. And the theory explains that how technology change influence the organization landscape. So process discontinuity occurs in forms of either substitution or innovation that results in major breakthrough uh, in an, any given industry. And the, the reason why industry use for any kind of process discontinuity is to change the paradigms or shift the paradigm. And these discontinuities are categorized in, in Tushman's work as competence destroying discontinuities and competence enhancing discontinuities. So let me just quickly go through what is competence destroying uh, discontinuity. It refers to new ways of making products or completing tasks that requires completely new skills, new abilities, and new technologies that as a resultant practice are fundamentally different from the existing practice, whereas the competence enhancing discontinuities refers to improvements in existing ways of making products or services or completing tasks and do not make existing skills, knowledge and ability obsolete, rather than it incrementally improve by the use of technologies. So both types of discontinuities typically occurs uh, due to changes in competitive environment and it forces organizations to keep on introducing new technologies and new processes in this case. So it often lead to organizational change and adoption issues and requires people to discontinue their legacy practices and technologies in favor of new technologies and practices, which is often uh, met by stiff resistance in organizations. So the legacy technologies, which were supposed to be uh, improving the organization innovation and uh, product or process development as, as the original or initial idea. After a certain period of time, when we try to change this legacy practice and legacy technologies, they themselves become a blockade for the new technology and become a source of resistance due to the familiarity of the users and of course the strong institutionalization. Right. And our analysis in this paper also results in um, an exploration of or that demonstrates that competence enhancing practices, there is a tension which arises between individuals and have got potential to revert back to legacy practices. Um, I'm gonna skip this part and just quickly glance through this methodology part and paper has got a detailed methodology. We were we use a exploratory case study analysis using an organization APG from Netherlands, which is a large uh, pension uh, funds organization. Um, we collected data from nine semi-structured interviews. In each interview was ranged between 30 to 30, 45 minutes. Um, and we use the purposeful sampling approach uh, from a cross-sectional of the process mining users. And of course, we use a data analysis tool in Vivo to um, perform our data analysis. We approach, the approach we used was inductive data analysis where we allow a grounded approach. Uh, in terms of quality of our coding and analysis, we use coder corroboration where three 
um, researchers uh, coded the data in parallel and share our experiences and correct it as we go. All right, and we also use some of the advanced features of query. So in the interest of time, I'll look at uh, our, our summary of finding in this slide. So we identified seven challenges related to process mining. The first one was the process complexities. The nature of process dependency, interdependency with other processes pushes users to not to adopt the new technologies, in this case, the process mining. Data and information quality challenges associated with nature of, of a data which is used by process mining tools. Uh, and collaborative tensions refers to issues between different teams. They are collaborating with each other for sharing information. Uh, governance challenges were associated and, and attributed, uh, attributes to uh, 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 roles and responsibilities, policies and procedure, which can restrict uh, process mining uh, efficiency and effectiveness. User tailoredness was relative to how users which are familiar with the previous different techniques of business intelligence or, for example, for example, Lean, Lean Six Sigma, et cetera, et cetera, um, how the, the customization of, of tools uh, can satisfy their requirements. User issues were, were actually uh, talk about and discuss about various issues from users in terms of their technical competence, their resistance issues, et cetera, et cetera, and technical challenge was related to the tools capabilities itself. We also identified from our data four enablers for process mining, which are uh, actionable insights, um, which is used for decision making by the organizations and decision maker. Perceived benefits of process mining uh, is the resultant outcomes of process mining, improved um, results. Training and development associated with uh, practices and techniques used to train the staff or the users to use process mining tools. And confidence in process mining itself is based on the outcomes or actionable insights from process mining. So what we identify that they, these challenges actually pull the users back towards their old practices and their old methods of doing process analysis. Whereas the enablers forces the users to pull back towards process mining tools. In this case, it was Silonis. And this creates a tension between the two forces which we refer as uh, competence enhancing uh, tensions. So in the interest of time is only 40 seconds I have, I'll jump on to the conclusion. So in this exploratory work and is research in progress, we identify seven challenges and seven four enabler. We, we have believed that using the insights from the data, we are presenting a initial framework to explain how technology um, challenges and enablers of process mining interact. The case is of course limited to a single organizational experience, uh, therefore it cannot be generalized. However, the finding of this study will be beneficial for those organizations currently embarking into their process mining journey. And we are still in the progress uh, process of uh, further exploring and, and extending our research to identify additional relationship by studying other organizations that have more mature use of process mining. Uh, that's the gist of the paper and I am almost done. Thank you very much. If you have any question, I'm happy to answer together with my colleagues, uh, Rebecca, Sander and uh, Yus. Thank you very much, uh, Rihan. A very nice presentation. Also, uh, you can see from there that you have done quite uh, extensive uh, analysis and study. I think it's it's very meaningful. So, congratulations for the work. Uh, Thank you. But now it's time for questions. Uh, Masi, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Not yet. So maybe maybe I can ask with one question. I was wondering the impact of the te the, the actual technology you are using to get those insights. So uh, for instance, as an example, it's not the same as the, if you approach an organization from a technology that comes from academia, that from a technology that comes from industry, but also within the industry, you can see that there are different segments. So uh, I was wondering if you were making any assumption down there. Um, 
if I understand your question correctly, um, your question is about whether we are making any assumption whether organizations are using process mining or not. Well, or the process mining technology they are using. Um, I think uh, if, I, if I look at, for example, if you look at this slide here, it shows a comparison between process mining and RPA. And the stark difference is already there where RPA is going to hit uh, in 2020, 4 billion US dollar, whereas process mining is going to hit only maximum of 430 million dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's not the issue with the technology. Um, our premise is that issue is not with process mining as a tool is a very effective tool. Is the issue is has been discussed by various and has been spoken on social media, various experts, including uh, Will and uh, Marlon Dumas that organizations are reluctant to accept process mining as a viable tool for making their decision, for making better process improvements and analysis technique. And of course, reasons are pretty obvious because a process mining tool can show the actual performance and actual hidden issues under the old good old techniques. And management is not very happy to do this and take this kind of risks. That's why we did not take a technical perspective, we look at the use and adoption perspective, and we still use a technology um, uh, discontinuation theory, which was, I think in 1986 and 1992 versions, to explain the phenomena that why such a beautifully designed tool, such a powerful tool, is not yet taking its right place in the industry, especially from the users of the, of the process mining. Uh, did I answer your question, uh, Joseph? Yes, 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 absolutely. Th thanks a lot for the clarification. Let's see whether we have more questions. Uh, no, but I think I can have a question myself. Uh, thank you for your work. And it's very insightful to see a list of uh, challenges. Uh, of course, this list of challenges are important uh, to point out uh, because you want to find a solution for them. Uh, do you all have any feeling how these challenges can be tackled? Uh, and the second question is, do you think that these challenges are shared uh, among several organizations or some of these challenges are specific to the case study that you investigated? Um, I'll go with your first question first. So yes, we are working on understanding the potential solutions. And of course, if you notice, most of the solutions are not new. For example, awareness of technology has been discussed in IS literature over the period of time. So the challenge is if you look at, if they're looking at solutions, so for example, how we can, we can actually motivate the final decision makers to understand the gap. There's the question of awareness. The question is a lobbying <laughs> elements in terms of why this particular technology is not being sought after and not being at, 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 at motivating uh, to final decision maker who's going to invest money in any technology. So what is the issue with CFOs and CIOs and CTOs? So that's the area I think requires further investigation and try to understand what, what are the other issues they have in their mind before they give process mining is due place in, in organization. Uh, your second question, if you could repeat again, uh, Masi, uh, I, I missed your second question. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, you mentioned several challenges. Do you think that some of these challenges are peculiar or specific to that organization? Or you think that some are, uh, and, or they are all general? Uh, in our other work, evidence to date is uh, most organizations face the similar challenges. Is these challenges are not only associated with this particular organization that we study. Um, some of the organization that we are studying here as well also shows the similar issues. And uh, if we look at the uh, current white papers and industry statistics uh, and, and reports from Gartner's and, and uh, Forrester's, uh, our findings are not so much different. Okay. So challenges are of course like applicable to all of the organizations what we discuss here. Okay, thank you for your clarifications. Thank Good. you. So I would so... suggest to move on a bit again. So thanks again, Rihan, it's such a nice, uh, uh, presentation, such a nice work. Next, so I ask you to, to
to sh switch off your video, Rihan, so we can get, get now Adrian. So next speaker is Adrian Redman. He will present uh, the paper IO based activity recognition for process assistant in human robot disaster response. Uh, this is a joint work with Jana Rebecca Res, uh, Mira Pinter, Marius Schnobold, Kevin Down, and Peter Fetke. So, Adrian, the floor is yours. So, hi all, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so I'm uh, Adrian. I'm a PhD student at the University of Mannheim. Uh, today I'm presenting work done at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence together with Jana Wesel, Mira Pinter, uh, Marius Schnaubel, Kevin Down and Peter Fetke. Um, the title of our paper is IoT-based activity recognition for process assistance in human robot disaster response and um, as you can see from the title, we are in the area of rescue robotics. So in uh, rescue missions or disaster response scenarios where um, robots are employed to assist humans. And uh, the, the motivation for that is, um, first of all, rescue missions are very dangerous for first responders. Um, as an example, in 2017, almost 60,000 firefighters um, in the United States were hurt or killed during uh, such missions. Um, also, these robots are becoming more and more advanced. Um, on the right hand side, you see uh, two examples, uh, a drone and an unmanned ground vehicle on the bottom. And um, those, for example, are also used in large scale um, rescue missions such as the uh, fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral last year. Um, yeah, so uh, you might wonder what does that have to do with BPM? So um, these disaster response missions are um, in general organized in a, in a process oriented way. Um, so the, the people that are involved, the officers in charge and um, the operators also of the robots are um, following very strict um, rules and regulations and are training scenarios quite frequently. And that alone um, al already motivates the application of BPM approaches. And at the DFKI, there has been some past research um, to provide process assistance based on the humans activities. So this was based on um, analyzing the team communications between um, the team members that were taking part in this uh, or were um, working in these um, disaster response scenarios. And in this work, we wanted also to incorporate the operations of the robots uh, into this overall context. So we aim at the visualization and documentation of the robot operations uh, during a mission. And we want to do that based on IoT data that is produced by the robots uh, during their runtime. And we want to provide uh, real-time support on the one hand, and on the other also enable post-mission analyses um, based on the recorded process traces. Um, so um, this makes that analyzable in uh, these post-mission analyses. And um, for this, we created an exemplary scenario um, which you can uh, hopefully see in the video that is now playing. So um, we have this unmanned ground vehicle you saw on, on the first slide. Uh, you see that uh, on the bottom right corner, uh, which performs um, a couple of activities such as searching for specific objects or humans that are victims in um, an industrial fire, for example, which is the basic use case we are uh, using as a running example and um, also targeting um, um, these objects so approaching the, the destination. And on the, on the top left, you see really already the goal of our approach, which is to, in real time, um, record this as a process and show this to the stakeholders. And yeah, so um, our conceptual design of the approach um, can be uh, formulated as follows. So um, first, we, we need to define 
a set of activity types which are which are a robot specific so depending on the on the capabilities of the specific robot we define this activity type set and we do that um, with a bpmn ad hoc sub process as you can see on the bottom here and based on on this activity uh, types we aim at recognizing the activities uh, based on the iot data which is streamed from the robot during a mission and using a supervised machine learning approach we um, do a continuous classification of um, the activity that is currently running in fixed time intervals so we we segment the, the iot data and uh, make classifications every um, time interval um, the results of this um, recognition is then mapped onto a process that is really defined in a, a process repository and um, there is a mapping between this recognition results and the activity types that are defined within a process model and they also th then trigger um, the start and completion of activity instances within a running process instance and based on that we can also um, continuously query the state of the process instance and visualize it to the uh, uh, stakeholders as you saw in the uh, video before and also um, in um, yeah concurrently also document this for post mission analysis um, we conducted uh, an evaluation uh, using this simulation environment that was also shown in the video so we don't uh, so we didn't use an actual robot for that but a simulation um, we evaluated in two stages first we evaluated the this classification approach uh, as standalone so um, for that we had to do some get, uh, data gathering and pre-processing um, so we asked uh, 10 participants of a case study to um, execute the defined use case um, while they were doing that we labeled the activities that they were performed uh, manually then based on some pre-processing and um, this pre-processed pre data and uh, the labels we trained a random forest classifier and eva evaluated that um, yeah the results were quite promising so um, with an exception of activity c here uh, the the results are quite satisfactory c in this case is just the the weight uh, activity which was hardly performed during this case study because the users just executed the tasks of the case study um, yeah and uh, as a second step we evaluated the whole uh, system so we asked um, five participants to con uh, yeah to perform two um, different variants of the use case process so we switched some activities um, and uh, the system was running during these, um, uh, yeah, during these process instances, and then we compared uh, the activities or process instances that were recorded to the ones that were actually uh, performed. And to show some exemplary results, um, here you have in the top row the actual activity that was performed in a process instance and on the bottom you see what our approach recognized and you see that this uh, works quite well for um, the most part uh, except um, when there is a transition between two two activity types you um, have some misclassifications uh, sometimes uh, to show an example for this post mission analysis, we loaded the XAS log that we could export from this um, evaluation. Uh, so the few instances that were generated during evaluation, we loaded that into um, Disco here. And you see that this actually yielded uh, quite a yeah, more or less structured process compared to an ad hoc process that we defined. Uh, yeah, so as an outlook, we um, aim to extend the approach uh, by incorporating multi perspective sensor data. So uh, here we only used a single uh, mo motion sensor that was mounted on the robot. Uh, we also want to use multiple sensors. 
improve the classification and um, also experiment with uh, edge computing scenarios, for example. So this whole processing could be done on the robot itself. Um, right now it is done on the server. And um, we would also like to test that with an actual robot and combine the work uh, we did with the previous work I mentioned before with the team communication. And um, yeah, based on what we did, we also want to provide actual process-based services um, based on this visualization and uh, recognition. So for example, recommendation services to uh, the response team. So this would be my presentation. Thanks very much, Adrian, um, for a nice work and really applied and uh, seems to, in some sense, save lives, which is always uh, a very meaningful thing. So, but now we have time for questions. Masi, do we have questions? For yes, Andrea? we have a question from Andrea Burattini. So I will, let, I will let Andrea ask the question directly. Please, Andrea, go ahead. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Um, so thanks a lot for the nice presentation. I really liked it. And uh, as Giuseppe said, it's nice to have these applied work sometimes. Um, I was just wondering, uh, uh, so, so you mentioned that um, you're using single sensors and you mentioned that you're using some, you have been using some manual labeling for the activities. Yes, exactly. So I, I, I would expect, I mean, I've been touching this topic in the past and I would expect that you have several configurations uh, or better you have the same configuration for the sensors for example for the robot for the uh, joints of the robotic arm that are actually referring to different labels to different activities so yes. are you are, are you dealing with that for example by using information from the context or from the previous activities or uh, so yeah how are you dealing with this problem uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Um, right now we are using a single IMU sensor, which just um, records the motions of the, the robot, really. Um, we are not using the, the joint uh, sensors um, and are also not incorporating any context uh, of, the, of the activities, except for, uh, for the the noise that is uh, inserted by the direction in which the robot is moving. So that is at least some context. But um, yeah, apart from that, um, the sensor we have is really basic. So it's just one IMU sensor. OK, thank you. Then uh, maybe the, the follow up active, uh, question, if, if, uh, if I can, Giuseppe and Marcy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead, though, no problem. Yeah, would be whether you're using any so how are you labeling the activities then? So how are you deciding at which abstraction level that you want to stop with the labeling? Uh, is it something that is imposed, let's say, by, by, the, by the data that you have available? Or are you so we have something a, else? We implemented a, a labeling tool. Um, and the abstraction level is the same as in this uh, ad hoc process that was shown before. So uh, we label the capabilities or tasks that a robot can do while he is doing it um, with a start and an end timestamp. And um, based on that, we can train the classifier. So we know when the activity started for real and we know when it ended. And then we can um, train the classifier on different uh, also time windows. So there's also possibility to, ver um, to vary the, the um, frequency of uh, activity classifications, which in our case, um, if I go back, is shown here by the, the segments you see here. So one of these segments is one um, classification. So the whole activity here um, really encompasses four um, classification steps in total. Does okay, thank you very much. Are you satisfied, Andrea? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, any other question? Uh, otherwise, uh, I can ask myself one, uh, if I can. Uh, so, OK, hello, then I will sh make it short. Uh, during my PhD, I was also working on uh, rescue missions and uh, in business process management. And what I noticed is that the traditional uh, 
rigid uh, imperative models would not work uh, in these scenarios. Uh, so what kind of uh, modeling language would you use to represent the, these processes? Are you aiming at BPM, N, or PetriNet, or more to something declarative? Because I think the second might be a bit better, given the uh, flexibility yeah, so of these processes. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, right now we uh, relied on a BPMN just because we are using an, a system that we had um, that was already connected to an execution engine with a designer for BPMN, but also um, declarative models um, maybe allow for a bit more uh, flexibility here. Um, maybe, I don't know if Jana can say anything about that yeah. because she, yeah. I can. Um, Actually, thanks for the question. This is a pretty, because it's a really good question. Um, maybe going beyond the, the scope of the, the paper that we're discussing here, uh, this is actually a really relevant problem. Um, so thinking about it, we've so far used a couple of, of, um, of languages. We have um, a reference model which describes like how your your first responders have to or should should operate in their um, during missions that is modeled as an as a set of EPCs. Now here we're using BPMN, um, but in the end, my answer is that I have not yet found a modeling language that is able to fulfill all purposes that we need here, um, because sometimes what you want to do is visualize your process that may makes you needs. That means you may need to make it really, really simple. And on the other hand, you, in this context, like here, you need an, um, a language that is executable, just like like BPMN. So the short answer is we're using a, some different types of, of, of languages depending on the, the individual use case of the of the respective model. Let me just cut it here because we we still have two two papers. Thanks, Jana, and thanks, Adrian, for the work. But let's move on. Uh, we still have two interesting papers. Uh, next speaker is Marwa Eliuk. Uh, the, the paper title is Discovering Activities from Emails Based on P Pattern Discovery Approach. So a joint work with Oemina Alawi, Nassim Laga, Walid Galun, and Bonem Benatala. Please, Marwa, go ahead. Okay, just uh... Share the screen. So you you seen my screen? Yes. Okay. okay, thanks. So hi everyone, I am uh, Marwal Ash, and in this presentation I will talk about our paper entitled "Discovering Activities from Emails Based on Pattern Discovery Approach," whose contributors are coming from Orange Labs uh, in France, Telecom de Paris, and University of New South Wales uh, in Australia. So first, I will begin by illustrating the general context of our work. So our work is inscribed in the context of discovering uh, act, uh, business processes from emails. Uh, since emails are nowadays widely used by employees to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to execute their daily business tasks. However, due to the unstructured nature of uh, the logs data of emails, we need a, a step to convert it into a structured format compatible with the existing business process uh, discovery techniques. And uh, this step in its turn requires the recognition of three main entities, which are um, uh, process, uh, process names, activities, and entities. Obviously, the recognition of these uh, entities from emails. And in this work, we have been focused on the discovery of activities from emails uh, to be a first step towards um, uh, business process discovery. So in this, the same context, we have identified mainly three challenges that we have been proposed to, uh, uh, to handle during our work. So the first challenge is how to discover multiple activities within one email and even when I don't, one sentence. Um, in fact, emailing systems uh, are uncontrolled information systems, so there are no specific rules to be respected by employees when introducing their activities. Taking this example of email retrieved from the uh, public data set and run, uh, here the sender introduces at least 
for activities in the first sentence, for example, we introduce an activity of uh, opening short chain position. However, in the last sentence, he introduces three activities of cutting deal, replacing deal, and purchasing power. Uh, the second challenge is how to discover business data of activities. And here we define business data as the data generated uh, or used by activities during their execution, such as here the quantity of the traded energy expressed in megawatts here and the uh, no number of the trading hours. And finally, the third challenge is how to discover activities without disclosing prior knowledge about them and also without the need of human intervention, which presents a challenge in relation with the field of data mining in general. Uh, so to discover activities from emails while answering to all these challenges, we have supposed during our work mainly two assumptions. The first assumption we have cons uh, considered that the business process corresponds to um, uh, frequent behaviors of actors when executing their activities in emails. Uh, so and this implies that for each business process, there are at least um, or there are uh, necessarily some employees that are specialized in the execution of specific uh, activities. So our first proposition here that discovering frequent uh, activities as first step from emails can bring us to the discovery of business process themselves. In the second exception, I have supposed that if the same employee frequently introduces um, the, same uh, the same activity in his emails, he would have high probability to use close writing steel to express the same frequent activity in his emails. And this writing steel will be reflected uh, by the frequent expression that he uses in his emails. So our uh, uh, second proposition here is to, is to discover such frequent uh, expressions in the form of frequent patterns of words to, uh, to, um, to discover activities. So uh, to summarize our main proposition for discovering activities from emails is to introduce a pattern discovery based approach and which is com composed mainly of four main phases. In the first phase, we do some preposition steps on emails sent by employees. And uh, among these steps, we detect and replace named entities and numeric values by tags. Uh, and the step will be useful later for discovering and uh, detecting uh, business data types that we propose to, uh, to discover. In this second phase, we group emails uh, by sender uh, to enable email analysis per employee. And this allows first um, verifying our second assumption that I introduced later uh, previously, and also um, uh, decreasing writing steel variance when analyzing emails uh, in order to decrease uh, or which could decrease noise at the level of the generated uh, results in terms of activities. The third phase uh, discover effectively frequent activities per employee based on patterns detection and the output of this phase will be frequent activities organized per employee. So we need a fourth phase to uh, group uh, similar activity that can be executed by different uh, employees. So uh, the third phase here presents a key step in our key phase in our approach. And it is in its turn composed of three main uh, steps. So the first step is to effectively to learn a frequent patterns of words from emails of each employee. And comparing to existing works that uh, discover uh, patterns of words from uh, textual documents in general, here we have been made uh, two kinds of contributions. In the first contribution, we have considered low dispersion constraints when discovering frequent patterns of words um, from emails to avoid obtaining a significant pattern of, of words and which uh, correspond generally to the high dispersed pattern that can be found in emails. And also uh, in the second uh, contribution, we have tolerated the use of different words having similar relations when, uh, during the process of constructing patterns and that by introducing the notion of patterns of concepts. So the pa a pattern of concepts is equal to the set of concepts where each concept uh, regroups the set of uh, word synonyms that can be used in the same context. So taking the example of these two emails uh, where the, the first email contained the terms purchase and power and the second email uh, contains the terms buy and power here. If we, uh, if we would want to detect the pattern of concept that is in common between these two emails while verifying low dispersion constraints, they will find a pattern composed of two concepts. The first concept regroups the terms purchase and buy because there are synonyms and the, uh, the second concept contains the term power. Uh, 
Now, after uh, detecting or learning frequent patterns uh, of concepts from emails of each employee by correlating each per pair of emails uh, by, uh, by finding their intersection in terms of patterns and concepts, we reclassify the obtained patterns into patterns that uh, contain verbs, uh, which would uh, potentially correspond to activity names and also patterns uh, that do not contain verbs and to, which would potentially correspond to business data patterns. And finally, we group all the obtained patterns into activities. So here the idea is first to, act, uh, to organize activity names patterns by their verbs. Then to uh, identify highly correlated uh, patterns to these activity names patterns in terms of coexistence in the same email. And finally, to use uh, the similarity in terms of business data patterns to regroup uh, activity names uh, patterns into activity types. So at the end, we obtain for each activity type um, a kind of semantic um, characterization in terms of patterns uh, that uh, uh, enable later uh, its detection uh, in uh, other emails. So here, an example of, um, of the, the same email that I, pre I introduced previously, after the, the discovering and the detection of its activities using uh, their uh, associated patterns. To evaluate our approach, here we have used emails retrieved from the public uh, dataset Enron, and we have carried out two types of evaluation. In the first evaluation, we have calculated the recall of our approach to um, evaluate its capacity in retrieving uh, existing activities. So we have first annotated email of two employees in terms of existing activities. One of uh, it uh, has the role of trading manager and the other has the role of an administrative assistant. Then we have selected the most frequent activities and we have applied our approach and mapped the described activities to the annotated ones. And finally, we have calculated the recall per activity. So here the table was summarized the obtained uh, results. Um, and here we can notice that in this column, we summarized the obtained activities that uh, our activities are of two types. The first type uh, includes the trading activities such as selling or buying electricity power uh, or uh, opening short or long a trading position. And the second type of activities includes uh, organizing interviews or scheduling meetings or reserving conference rooms. And after, uh, he, so here the uh, column that summarizes uh, the, uh, the recall of the, all these activities all of all these activities and after calculating their average we have obtained a value of 0 0.86 which seems good knowing that we have worked in a context or a completely non-supervised context as in the second evaluation type we have calculated the accuracy of our approach to evaluate the relevance of the detected activities so here we have extended the evaluation that I said to uh, cover emails of five employees and we have applied our approach. Then we have annotated the obtained activities in terms of relevance. And finally, we have calculated the activities uh, accuracy per employee. So this uh, table uh, summarizes the obtained accuracies. Uh, and after calculating the average, we have obtained a value of 0 0.87. So to conclude, during our work, we have discovered activities from emails using a pattern discovery approach with a supervised way. And our approach allowed the detection of business data and also the multiple detection of activities and in one email and even in one sentence. Also, we have validated our approach using emails for, uh, retrieved from the public dataset Enron. And finally, we have publicly shared our results uh, for reproducibility reasons. Uh, in terms of perspectives, we aim to extend our approach for generating event logs uh, uh, in the context of business process discovery from emails. Uh, and uh, also we are exploiting our results for uh, um, discovering other perspectives of business processes such as data and actor perspective. So towards the end of this presentation, I Thanks, will thank Thanks. Thanks, we are a bit uh, short of time. So we have time for one short question. Uh, mm -hmm. Masi, is there any question from the audience? Uh, no, there is nothing yet. So, so Mar Marwa, on this extension that you plan to, 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 to do, I was wondering how would you incorporate, for instance, emails? So one of the extensions is to actually generate full event logs with the relations. And I think the sending between different users 
correlates with the traces you are getting, I guess. But uh, so you get a trace if you get uh, an email that is sent between different people and you know by the timestamps how to sort out, sort this out. But I was wondering the, the following use case where you have that you are not treating just one single case, but in this interchange, you, you, you do some kind of batch activity, like saying like, here, I want to tell you about this, this, and this case. So you have several cases between different uh, users, and sometimes it's not so easy to, to collect the, 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 the emails, sorry, the, the traces out of this. I know this is not part of your work, by the way. It's just yes, uh, the question is how to exploit our results to uh, generate event logs. Is this, this yeah. the question? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Case. Uh, the, the the idea uh, is uh, okay. Um, if we are, we are able to um, to detect activities from emails, the idea is then to associate what we detect uh, as activities to to each email. Then, um, in terms of timestamp, here in emails, we can uh, we know that the, well, the station is more difficult than standard uh, information systems or structured information systems. Here we can, uh, for generating, for example, uh, business process models, we can locally um, discover constraints between uh, activities in terms of uh, their succession in, in the same email. For example, this is activity appear uh, before this activity or something like that. Thanks. Thanks, Marwa. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So for, for the sake of time, I would suggest to move on because we are we only have 10 minutes left, but we will we will extend a bit. Uh, yeah. so, thanks, Marwa. Mm -hmm. Just one comment because I see there are just now happening two questions. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, Josep was saying, it's not possible to ask them now. Uh, but uh, you can ask later when there is a the session for coffee with authors and uh, Marwa will be there, right? To okay. answer any questions. Yeah, thanks Marwa. Mm -hmm. Let, let's mm -hmm. move on, please. Okay. Um, so the last session, the, the last paper today is presented by Jari Per Percon. Uh, its title is Conform and Checking Using Activity and Trace Embedding. This is a joint work with Seppe van der Broek and Josh Endebert. So please, Jari, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so hello, I'm Jari, PhD at the KU Leuven. Uh, and I'm going to present you a new process conformance checking technique using activity and trace embeddings, uh, work I did uh, with Josh Endebert and Seppe van der Broek. Um, within the field of process mining, one of the topics is uh, conformance checking, which is concerned with the question, how well does a certain model describe a certain log? Uh, in this work, we will discuss a novel technique with, uh, with which you can measure global conformance in throughout two quality dimensions, namely precision and fitness. The work is inspired by techniques from natural language processing and uses meaningful embeddings for activities and process instances. Uh, we have designed three different variants of the technique. In order to understand the technique, you should know what a vector representation or embedding is. In short, an embedding is a map from a certain categorical variable onto a multidimensional vector of real numbers. Uh, these different embeddings for the different values of this variable are learned, often in a self-supervised fashion, but not necessarily. And the vectors are supposed to be meaningful and should not be too high dimensional. Uh, in this way, they are the opposite of one-hot vectors, which are high dimensional vectors full of zeros and few ones corresponding to the specific category. Uh, to make this a little bit more understandable, let's look at the most famous example, word to vec In uh, word to vec each word from a, different, uh, from a dictionary gets a vector representation, and the idea is that similar words get similar vectors. These embeddings are trained using a big amount of text where the words are used in a correct context. And this is used uh, as training data for an artificial neural network with one hidden layer. The input and the output of the network are one hot encoded representations of the word. words. And the weights used in the neural network are exactly the word embeddings. 
they can be trained in two ways. The continuous bag of words, where we are trying to predict a certain word based on the words in the window around it. Or the skip gram method, where we are trying to predict the window around a word given that word during training. A variant of Word2Vec called Doc2Vec allows the user to also give as input a certain paragraph ID or document ID corresponding to the paragraph or document these words are located in. In this way, also a representation for that document is trained. In a process mining context, we can now use different ways to introduce these vector embeddings. The first act to vec works similarly as word to vec but the words are activities and we learn embeddings using an event log. And a second way, trace to vec adds the trace ID as input, which allows us to also learn a representation for each trace in that event log. So now we can start uh, continue with the actual technique. So we start with a real log and a process model, and we want to check if the model describes the log properly. In order to do this, we first play out the model, play out the model. So we artificially generate a log corresponding to this model, called the model log. Using both logs as data set, we can then train embeddings for the activities and possibly also for the traces. We then need sort of a dissimilarity function, which can measure how dissimilar two traces are. Using this function, we can then generate a dissimilarity matrix comparing each trace from the real log with each, with each trace from the model log. If we, can, if we then take the average of the minimum of each column, so we look at the average best match of each real trace as compared to all of the model traces, we can get a measurement for the fitness of the process model. If we take the average of the minimum of each row. So we look at the average best match of each model trace as compared to all of the real traces. We can get a measurement for the precision in theory. So just to be clear, the lower this number, the better, and zero is optimal, is perfect fitness or precision. A first concrete way of using this technique would be by using the activity embeddings for each different type of event. To measure the distance between two traces, we have used two different functions. The first is the so-called word movers distance, a variant of the earth movers distance. Um, this WMD measures the minimal transportation cost to transport every word or activity from one sentence or trace to another. In in this context, the weight of an activity is determined by how often it is present in the trace and the distance between two activities is the cosine distance between their embeddings. In a process mining context, the earth movers distance was also used by recent work of Lehmanns et al, who used the stochastic labels as weights. A big disadvantage of this function is that, is that the measurement is slow because of the search towards a minimal configuration. And therefore we have also tested a more efficient lower bound of the WMD called the ICT which drops one of the constraints of the word movers distance. Because of uh, these performance issues, we have also looked into an alternative way which uses trace to vec In this method, next to the activity embeddings, we also learn trace embeddings. Uh, we only use distinct traces, such that equal traces have only one representation. Uh, we can then simply use a cosine. Um, we can then simply use a cosine distance between the vector representations as trace, uh, representing a trace as the similarity function. The main advantage uh, of this is that it is faster. I will now shortly show you some of the experimental evaluation we have performed. So, in a first uh, experiment. Um, we do the following, we generate different model process trees which have different parameters, like the amount of loops, end gates, or gates, etc. And we can convert this process tree into a petri net, and from this petri net generate a model log, which we call the ground truth log. We can then add noise to this log to get a noisy log, and then compare these two logs with the techniques and check whether adding noise increases the dissimilarity measurements. 
we have added noise in two different ways and I will show you some plots showing the average values over all different models. First, adding a little noise to different amount of traces. The other experiment uh, concerns itself with adding different amounts of noise within a fixed 40% of the traces. From these two experiments, we could see that the techniques are capable of correctly assessing whether logs, when logs start to differ from each other. And the, techniques using, the technique using trace embeddings is however less sensitive to which extent the two traces are different as compared to the other techniques. Indicating the trace embeddings might be slightly less sensitive in detecting how different two traces are as opposed to only detecting if they are different. In a second experiment, we start out in the same way, but instead of adding noise, we use different discovery techniques to discover different models. We then calculate the fitness and precision of each of these models with a ground truth log and compare it with the techniques from literature. Um, in short, the results from these experiments were when literature agreed, our models confirmed as well. And when they did not agree, it is harder to interpret. More testing is probably needed. Uh, so to conclude, we have introduced a new conformance checking technique based on representation learning. It is fully data driven and shows to be an interesting alternative to classical approaches. And the neural network uh, embeddings provide an abstraction which might be further leveraged in the future. We showed three different variants, which are all capable of detecting fitness and precision issues, the slower ECT2VEC and WMD or its faster variant ICT and the alternative trace to vec method. Uh, there are multiple possibilities for uh, future improvements and I have listed some of them. First of all, the method should be standardized, so output a value between zero and one instead of uh, the higher the number being the worst fitness. The methods could also take order more explicitly into account. This could be done, for example, by using n-gram embeddings instead of single activities, but this could also be done by altering the distance function, in, distance function itself or by using a recurrent neural network-based approach. The methods should be expanded to check conformance beyond fitness and precision and should be tested on real-life logs and other improvements are also still on the table. And what we are probably going to do first with these self-supervised embeddings is trying to test them in another simpler context than conformance checking. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, be sure to ask them. Thank you very much, Zari. So I think there are questions from the audience, uh, Masi? Yes, there is a question from Andrea. Uh, I think he, is, uh, he can talk. Go ahead, I, please. Yes. Thank you very much for the very nice presentation. I really liked it. Uh, I was just wondering to what extent the technique is affected by the quality of the log generated by the simulation. Um, yeah. This, this, um, we have not tested it in this particular context, but we are also working on another uh, conformance checking technique, which also is dependent on the, on the log simulation. And you can see when the, especially when the model is overly general, like a, for example, a flower model, then of course the simulating the log will not describe the behavior of this, of this process model properly, because you cannot, uh, um, you cannot simulate all of the infinite possibilities. So there is some issue with that. When, the, when there are loops, a lot of loops and there are a lot of um, infinite possibilities for different traces. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, any other question? Uh, I, I see Sander has a question. Sander, go ahead. Hi, uh, Yari. Uh, very, uh, very uh, thanks for your, for your nice presentation. Um, and um, so halfway you made a comparison with uh, Earthmovers uh, conformance. Yes. Um, uh, at least from the, the stochastic side, and I would I would actually argue that you are actually very very close to uh, to to having also a stochastic technique. Um, 
because at the point you're doing simulation, um, you are uh, inherently taking probabilities into account. Um, so yeah, it's maybe more of a, of a suggestion or a, like, did you realize that than, than, a, than an actual question? So maybe to turn it into a question, did you realize that you actually uh, introduced uh, an, a new uh, stochastic conformance check? Um, yes and no. Uh, it's, um, it's not stochastic in the way that the the simulation for now was just a random random playing out of the the process models um, and i think the the weights are now just the the amount of times an activity uh, comes up in a certain process instance and we are not uh, considering stochastic uh, uh, weights uh, in our earth movers distance like uh, the similarity function so that's still a quite a difference but it's i think with some with some imagination you could alter the 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 method to be able to do stochastic uh conformance checking so I, I think you're already doing it uh because the, the stochastic process model is is nothing more than a uh it's like if you if you are simulating a model then you are in, in inherently stamping probabilities here and there because you need to decide randomly which trace you go for that's true um, yeah but yeah but you are yeah, you are playing out a model like uh enough to but i i i get your point you, inherently you have these 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 uh of course these probabilities when playing out uh, the model log but I think for now, yeah, the stochastic values are just uh, every every um, decision has the same uh, probability. But I, I, I get your point. Right, thank you. Thank you, Sander. So I don't know, Masi, I think it's time to stop because we yeah. have already six minutes run out yeah. of time. I think so. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Jari. Thanks all. Uh, Masi, do you want to conclude? Yeah, I, I want to thank you everybody for being there, here, and uh, I see that there were more than 60 people around, in the, so uh, this has been a good, uh, a good session, very nice papers. Uh, I know it's hard to, to be here for a long time online, it's not the same as being present uh, in the same room, so that's why I, th I want to thank you all twice for being keeping up with us, and uh, Looking forward to see you to the next sessions then. Take care. Okay. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye. Yeah.